Hey, how's it going? Good. How are you doing? Good. Am I coming in nice and clear? Oops. Yeah. Cool. You have a uh, setup worthy of a podcaster. <laughs> yeah, I figured it was, you know, I was getting interviews here and there, and I was like, well, I'm best and, you know, get uh I'm sure it drives you guys crazy when you get people on, like, crappy mics and <laughs> low-resolution <laughs> video cameras. Well, I've been doing this for a while. Not everybody has the uh, chops or... And the people that I end up enlisting for my cause are just normies, so... Yeah, sure, yeah. sure. I appreciate the uh, production values when I when it comes my way, though. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, no problem. What are you up to? Uh, not much. Just um, you know, just getting doing some doing some work and just uh, trying to keep busy. And it's kind of a, a gloomy day out, so I don't know if I'm going to get out afterwards. But where are you located? In uh, the southern, I guess, it's not a tip because it's a sound. I'm just outside of Olympia uh, in oh, Washington okay. State, oh, equidistant okay. Portland and uh, Seattle. Oh, cool. Yeah. Cool. So uh, rainforest. Uh, uh, terrain. Yeah. What's your terrain like? So it's, you know, Chicago weather is pretty erratic. Oh, Hot Chicago. summers, cold winters. Yeah. 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 How's, how's the autumn going? You know, it's it's nice. It's beautiful out here. You, we have so many different uh, trees that you get a really beautiful fall. And especially where we are, we, we're, you know, a few minutes from the lake. And yep. uh, it's, a, it's a very pretty area. I'm not in the city. I'm in a suburb about 45 oh. minutes north. So, By Evanston uh, or beyond? Uh, it's called Lake Forest. Oh. It's uh, not, not far from Evanston. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, uh, My mom works in Evanston. She's a uh, nurse at the hospital there. So, Okay. Yeah, I yeah. spent about five, six years in Chicago. Oh, cool. Yeah, uh, North Park area, into the okay. Ravenswood, Ravenswood line, uh, or the Brown line, I guess. Uh, I don't know if it's still called the Ravenswood. Okay, yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah sure. Cool. So you, you grew up there? Yeah, I grew up here. Um, lived here most of my life. Uh, my Did dad's, you leave for? Uh, um, I I actually went to Arizona for about two years, um, but and we lived in California for two years when I was a kid. But no, I've mm. pretty much stayed around here. Um, my uh, my mom's from Australia, so that's mm. okay. yeah. You, know, and, you wish uh, you were there. <laughs> not with what's going on now, especially <laughs> where she's from in Melbourne. It's uh, it's Ooh. gotten you know pretty huh. crazy. They. Uh, I, I don't know that the Australian people, you know, I, I, they're, they're pretty rugged individualists and they don't have a lot of tolerance for this. So I'm, it's just amazing what's, hmm. what's going on there. But, well, it's a Commonwealth We're yep. America's a little different. I, I don't really know the ins and outs. I should probably do an interview just specifically on, uh, I know Claire Lehman who runs Quillette did a write up that's been passed around quite a bit to try to show the differences in the conception of governance. Sure. Between Australia and the, the colonies, so called, and America. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know too much about the, poli you know, outside of what everyone's seen on the news. I mean, we've still got family there. I just don't really talk to them much about it, but mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. it is interesting. How did you get into history? Well, you know, I think it's, it had always been something I'd, I'd had a interest in and so you know in, in college I decided for some crazy reason to be a teacher um, and uh, been doing that since and um, you know as a being a history teacher is funny people think you're an expert on all these different things you're kind of a as a high school history teacher you're kind of a you know jack of all trades master of none kind of thing you, you have to know a broad range of kind of things and, and you learn as you go you know if, if yeah. you yeah, you throw a topic at you, so hmm. yeah, you got to know everything from a little world history to some U.S. to yeah. So um, it's always always learning something new, though. You know. Mm -hmm. So teaching came before history, then, with regards to your path. Um, no, actually, I so I did both. I dual majored in history and uh, education, okay. um, but I mean, it was it was something I you know. Since I was a kid, I, I always liked learning about history, and uh, it was probably my favorite subject. And uh, mm -hmm. you know, 
Do you, do you have ambitions to become historical yourself? <laughs> you know, uh, I, I don't know. I mean, it seems like this kind of spiraled the way uh, out of my control in a way I didn't anticipate. Um, you know, I, I'd like to, to, you know, do something positive for for our country in, in, in some way. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I try to keep that in mind um, with what I'm doing to make sure that uh, that I, I'm doing something productive and, um, you know, I, especially with Twitter can be kind of a, a complainer, complain sphere, if you want to call it that. And so I try to keep in mind, like, okay, next, what can I actually do or, you know, mm. we, we can, we can expose a lot of this and now what? And so that's something I'm kind of actively thinking about yeah. um, all the time. Do you have, uh, I mean, because you study history and, uh, and teach history, do you have a historical consciousness about the moment presently or, or uh, yeah. how would one approach this moment with a historical uh, consciousness in order to give us a better grounding and, you know, what's happening and how to behave within the happening. Sure. Um, you know, I, I see a, a lot of similarities between what is happening now and, and periods in, in, in human history where, um, nations and empires have been threatened by kind of identitarian movements. Mm -hmm. Um, I, you know, I look at like the Balkan regions um, prior to World War One, where you had, and and obviously there's a lot of you know differences, but we had this kind of strong resurgence in kind of a uh, ethnic identitarianism that you know ended up creating a uh, just a complete mess of a situation. And and I look at you know like China during the Cultural Revolution, where you had kind of political identities form around who was an oppressor and who was oppressed. And so hmm. my, my chief concern is that as this kind of identitarian movement in the United States grows, a diverse nation like ours, that we will see kind of a balkanization effect. And um, I don't think, you know, that alone is enough. I think, though, if you add some economic uncertainty, uh, some political uh, instability, and then you have a situation where people, um, it's already baked in where they've kind of started to place maybe ethnic or whatever type of identities before kind of a, a civic national identity. Hmm. You could have a, a dangerous situation and, and you mix that in with um, when these identities kind of become stratified by, you know, good guy, bad guy or oppressor and oppressed. Um People throughout history, they, they like to look for, for someone to blame when things get bad. And we already see a lot of that. So I, I kind of ask myself, I say, gosh, you know, what happens when, you know, if we entered some type of severe Great Depression, like, you know, like Germany did in uh, the 1930s, and, and people start looking, who, who are they going to blame? Well, it's already well, baked in. You, you know, uh, the way that uh, America is set up right now, our leadership would never let that happen. They got you don't backs. think so? No, no, they're, they're totally <laughs> so competent. Uh, sure, that they would never let a worldwide disaster uh, get in the way of Americans' uh, you know, forward movement right. towards <laughs> progress or whatever. Have you seen, or are there moments in history where these identitarian movements or these political idea identities formed? and had a beneficial effect, like some sort of competitive co-processing kind of thing, like where, where they're pitted together uh, somehow? Uh, or is it time and again, it becomes tribal, and then it leads to intractable uh, conflict? Yeah. I, I mean, I think when you look at kind of history broadly, um, identity can be a uh, identity based movements can be a force for unification i think you've seen throughout history that's been kind of a, a, an overall trend where we've gone from you know family units to tribes to city states and then you had kingdoms and you had and and there was a lot of violence and bloodshed through that process um and the the kind of nation state was kind of you know where you had peoples in these regions kind of collectively uh, brought together under a common banner. And then we started to see kind of these supranational organizations like the 
uh, European Union um, or, or you know, the United Nations. So I, I think that um, when identity serves to bring a broader group of people together, it can definitely be a force for good. I think right now what we're seeing, though, is we're seeing kind of movement in the opposite direction. Um, and people seem to be more retracting these kind of tribal identities um, as opposed to kind of the idea of being an American. I, I personally think that the the American identity is is actually very inclusive. It's, it's not based, uh, I know people disagree with me, but we've evolved it to a point where we've said it's not based on an ethnicity or a religion. It's based on um, you know, living in a territory and adhering to a certain set of values and principles and ideas. Mm. And I see a lot of this as threatening that. And, and, you know, now this is anecdotal, but even, you know, you see in classrooms, you know, students, uh, you know, stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. And, you know, I, I get that why, you know, not everyone's on board, but teachers kind of don't promote the idea of kind of an American identity and they think it's kind of silly. And so I wonder, mm -hmm. you know, kids growing up where their ethnic identity is placed at the forefront of their lives, um, that may not be best for the long-term health of our country. And, and when kids start to actively project the concept of an American identity, um, that, that scares me. Um, mm. Because people, look, for most people, they, they need identity. It, it's, I mean, everyone does. Um, and if they don't find it in kind of a, a broader inclusive identity like Americanism, they will find it somewhere else where it, it may not be unitary. Mm. Uh, maybe uh, there is a brief period of positive identity in an identity that is formed out of the rejection of identity. Right. And uh, that was really convoluted. But what I mean is within activist circles specifically, people come together to be against something or mm -hmm. to. Well, OK. And unfortunately, it doesn't have to be against something. It could be for something. But sure. the way that uh, politics have shifted over the last decade, decade, decade and a half, especially on the progressive left side of things. And Evergreen was a good example of this, where with this celebration of identity that they had called the Day of Absence and the Day of Presence, they separated uh, the students based on race for mm -hmm. one day, and then they came together the next day. And the separation was, you know, people, specifically uh, the black students, were uh, given time to workshop their identity and think about, you know, their history as black Americans. And then the day afterwards was the day of presence where everybody came together and kind of shared a cultural identity. But over the course of the years, uh, that separation became mired in negativity, like uh, where the white people learned about whiteness and white privilege and the black people learned about how oppressed they were. And, and then when you get to 2017, which is right before the dam broke, they were teaching Asians that they're basically white and Jewish people are supporting white supremacy and, you know, and then marginal, just getting all these marginal identities down. So it was what was about a celebration became about defamation or something like that. This oppositional defiant disorder kind of took root in the activist uh, thing. So activism doesn't have to be that way, but it seems to have become that way. And from what you've seen in education, seems like the same currents are going on. Is that fair to say? Yeah, I, I think so. It's something that I'd, I'd picked up on, you know, gosh, you know, 2012, I, I, my students were, were naive to a lot of this. And over the past few years, I, I would increasingly hear them use the the language that we're exposed to kind of on social media, they would ask about white privilege and about, you know, op oppression and mm -hmm. these types of things. And what struck me is I'd always engage back and, you know, what, try to clarify, what do you mean by that? And what and, and they didn't really know um, okay. even even their the definitions they gave me were just complete, even by their standards, uh, mischaracterizations of what white privilege is, you know, they'd say something like, well, you know, you, if you're white, you can murder someone and you can, you know, get away with it. And, you, and I said, like, what? And then they would say things like that. <laughs> I, I'd say, really? You believe that? And they're like, oh, yeah. Or you get, you know, um, 
you know, you won't go to prison for as long. I said, well, do you know that? Do you have evidence? Oh, it's just, you know, everyone knows that. And they would talk about being impressed. And I, I would ask them, I would say, you know, they'd say, oh, everyone, you know, we live in a racist country. And I'd hear that. And I'd say, can can you tell me, you know, like, you know, I want to know what is your experience with it? And I, I'm not meaning to, to say that they uh, haven't experienced it, but I... I was always very surprised by the answers they'd give me. They'd say something like, well, I, I went into the store and, you know, this Asian lady was watching me as my friends and I walked around the store. And I'd say, OK, I, I mean, I, I wasn't get like I'd say, do you have like did that? Did she say something or no? Is there any possible other explanation? And say, well, you know, you just, you know, white people just they just give you that look and say. So I was very you know startled by hmm. um, how they had kind of create, you know, through what they had been, were being taught or through what they picked up on, were kind of creating these worldviews that they didn't necessarily have as much um, justification for uh, believing as you'd think. And, you know, sometimes if you just ask them questions or try to challenge back on it, they'd say, oh, well, yeah, okay, maybe I misunder misinterpreted that, misunderstood, and you could get them and, and to a point of nuance. And that's what I, I always wanted mm -hmm. to try and do, is get mm -hmm. them to a point of nuance. Um, but that seems, you know, you're fighting kind of a, a force where they're repeatedly told these things and it just becomes their reality. And then every time, you know, every interaction they, they have after that is, is filtered through that understanding and lens. And hmm. I teach in a highly diverse community and I used to, um, I, I'd give them the same example. I'd say, guys, look, you know, I said, now I'm not saying it's the same thing, but I say, you know, I go into a store around here and I'm the only white person. I said, people, people stare at me and stuff. I said, there's two ways I can go with that. I can start interpreting that as hostility and I can become angry and resentful. And what are you looking at me for? And what do you mean you don't speak English? And, I'll, and we do see that, you know, in, in white, certain white populations and movements where they do build this resentment and anger and hostility. I said, or... You can just look at it as, you know, you're different and people are curious and they don't always have bad intentions. And sometimes you talk to people and I asked them, I said, if you've ever, you know, been in a way, have you ever, you know, do you talk to the people there? Have you ever? And um, I think a lot of times these things are just their misunderstandings, their our projections of our own insecurities and um and then mm. sometimes I'd have students that that would challenge back. They'd say, hey, I've been to, to you know, Lake Forest where it's all white. You know, I, I met some really nice people. You know, I was a little awkward at first. And um, I, I think there's there's definitely, you know, a positive way to look at these things. But they just hear the negative and they're they're told that assume the worst in people. And that's just so terrible to teach kids. I mean, um, mm. You know, or they, they think that, you know, the, the police are out to get them and they may not have a lot of them don't have any experiences where they've been pulled over stuff, but they have this idea planted in their head that the police are out to get them and they're constantly at risk. And, um, hmm. you know, it, yeah, it's crazy. So you were saying that when you first interacted with it, you got the sense that it was coming from social media, it was coming from kind of a larger cultural um kind of sea change which footnote it's kind of interesting that that happened during the obama era of all the eras like it would mm -hmm. be during obama's era which you know evidently things are changing uh, right. at least on this on the surface of things but also within there's a big debate right now about what the schools are trying to teach and uh, there's a lot of fighting about this CRT mm -hmm. and the gender stuff and uh, the critical theory stuff. And those ideas are very, very similar to this larger cultural shift towards being hyper vigilant about microaggressions and privilege and oppression and interpreting things in a negative light. How have you seen the progress from your own point of view? And if you have a larger data set, of critical theory into the public education and uh, you know what do you see going on there from the adult side of sure events? well so you know i think there's some people that think it's you know kids are walking in a classrooms and it's the first thing they hear every day and it's round the clock and and that's that's just that's not the truth and i i, I haven't made that claim i think it is it is accelerated though i think it's it's um 
oftentimes, and especially in the past, it was organic. It came, you know, from teachers wanting to include kind of these things they were learning about, you know, f- through the media and through kind of the the critical studies becoming kind of popularized in popular culture. And mm-hmm. and it's it's subtle and it was slow. And you would have, you know, occasionally, you know, you'd hear a teacher doing a lesson on this and, you know, privilege. And I think things started to change around 2016 and then 2020 again. So you had the election of Donald Trump. And a lot of teachers kind of felt that was a wake up call that they had to become politically active in their classrooms and talk about Mm -hmm. these things more and make their, you know, they couldn't be politically neutral. So I think you saw an acceleration of what had been more subtle uh, before then. And then when uh, the George Floyd uh, incident in 2020, that's when I really saw it pick up. And Mm -hmm. um, you started to see it on our school. uh, It was actually before then, but it kind of picked up momentum. You had the creation of a Department of Equity and Inclusion. Mm-hmm. And, you know, they started really, I, I would say the, the critical uh, critical theory became kind of institutionalized and um, it became kind of part of the mandate of the school that, okay, this is our, our ideological mandate. And in our school district, they it's still like it's it's kind of I kind of caught it early and started, you know, pulling stuff up. But they're going full steam ahead with yeah. training and, and bringing teachers into this. And, and then I think you have teachers, like I said, they're they're making it more explicit in their lessons. They feel that they want to be a part of this. And um, that's what I've that's what I've kind of noticed. Um, it's just it's just picking up momentum and picking up steam. I also think with. With the, the newer teachers coming in, they're bringing, as you know, we've seen kind of um, higher education over the past two decades become even more ideologically captured. Now, the, the younger teachers are bringing in what they learned in college directly into the classroom and the same with administrators. And I've, I've referred to it as trickle down radicalization, where it goes from, hmm. you know, the uh, upper tiers of the university down into the classroom. And... Um, I don't see any signs of it slowing down or stopping. I, I even think with the controversy over CRT and stuff, it's emboldened teachers. They now kind of feel like, well, now I can be a martyr for, for doing this. Now, I, uh, now I'm now i part of a bigger fight. It gives them mm. purpose. And mm. um, hmm. that's that's kind of my, my thoughts on that. So for somebody who's a noob, uh, who's concerned and, uh, hearing chatter, you know, they flip through the stations and Fox news, like CRT in our school. And then CNN's mm-hmm. like, Oh, it's no, no CRT in our school. And then somebody's like, well, it is, but it's not that bad. You know, blah, 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 blah. CRT is such a, it's an academic t- concept. It's a perfect right. thing to Mott and Bailey, you know, like where you say, right. well, all we're doing is teaching history, you know, well, are you teaching history? So what is it? What do you see? And why is it different than what came before? Yeah, so um, I think it's it's all it's it's existed f- for a longer period of time, and I think um, the CRT label it's look it's very rarely explicitly referred to. No one's coming in and saying we're going to teach critical race theory or we're going to use critical race theory. I think it's influenced um, a lot of the you know the concepts of you know, racism being a normal everyday kind of thing and the idea of okay. oppressed and oppressor groups and, and uh, all these different kind of white privilege. I think that it has played an influence in shaping, you know, broader uh, kind of movement. It has been, if you look at the literature, critical race theory has been expanded and applied to education. Um, so originally it was, you know, a lens for interpreting the law and now it's being used um, as a lens uh, for interpreting education and disparities in education, you know, regarding discipline and academics or behavior and student culture. And, um, you know, I found it used in, in, in by name once in my school district um, in an email kind of refer to this. But that doesn't mean that the, you know, the, the overall way of viewing the world I, I, I think of CRT as a lens. It's kind of a way of looking at, you know, originally it was a way of looking at, you know, the law, and now it's been applied to education. And hmm. um, I, I'd say that the bigger, a better thing way to call it is is uh, critical pedagogy. 
yep. which has been around since, you know, Paulo Freire. Um, and that's it, a lot of these things, they get kind of muddled together. They're not as distinct and, and clear as people say. So, mm-hmm. uh, you know, I can see when someone says, well, CRT isn't taught, I'm like, Okay, but I don't think anyone is is talking about them giving a class on it. I think they're talking about how the the lens of CRT is being applied to solving, you know, from a institutional level, and how teachers are implementing that lens and how they teach material and and imparting that lens on students. Um, so it it is very hard to discuss. I think what it did though is it it gave. I mean, the one benefit of the CRT discussion is it put a name to it. In that we were now able to say, okay, this is, we, we have a name for whatever this is, because it's a lot of things, DEI, diversity, equity, inclusion, which, you know. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question, It's because it is, it's so hard to untangle this mess. I'm still yeah. working on it. But I, 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 I tend to say, you know, when I say CRT, I'm talking about really a the racialized lens of viewing problems in education and view and, and filtering curriculum through. And I'll also refer to critical pedagogy, which includes a whole lot of other, you know, uh, things that um, are influencing how we think about education and how we approach it. Mm-hmm. And how is, how does critical pedagogy operate and how is it different from a classical pedagogy or an alternative pedagogy that was assumed to be the way that people taught and learned, which yeah, I'm sure is not perfect. None of these things are perfect, but right. Um, critical pedagogy is expressly political. Um, it has a, it has a political mandate in it. Um, it views schools as, uh, institutions of oppression as tools of the oppressor to, you know, indoctrinate students into the dominant, um, we, you know, they'd say white supremacy and, you know, cis normative worldviews. And so critical pedagogy is kind of a, this idea of a liberatory um, education, hmm. the idea that, you know, students need to be radicalized and they need to be kind of cognitive, cognitively uh, liberated um, from these kind of uh, oppressive structures and teachers have to play an active role in using schools as a political weapon to transform students in, into activists. Um, Paulo Freire um, admired what the Cultural Revolution had achieved with children um, and, and what Cuban schools were doing. And so that's kind of the goal of critical pedagogy is, yes, there's a part of examining pedagogy and curriculum and education through kind of a lens, uh, through kind of a critical lens. But it's also that that activist component is is also essential to it. So on the administrative level, the critical pedagogy and the critical race theory reduces, well, is a lens for evaluating disparities of outcomes between these different groups. And then assuming that most of these disparities come from some sort of structural bias or uh, oppressive nature of the system. Also, there's a push or a cynicism against normativity, that Mm -hmm. norms are being imposed and norms inherently are basically support a power structure that takes from the under the marginalized and gives to the majoritized or whatever. So there's that kind of bias on the structural level and moving towards uh, ameliorating these disparities by different means um, proceeds uh, along various different vectors, either by uh, changing the way that discipline happens or, uh, you know, devaluing grades or making, you know, uh, different forms of learning uh, Mm -hmm. more uh, documented uh, up to and including just giving kids grades that don't show up to class, which is uh, (laughs) mandated in in some areas. So there's that level. But what you were talking about on the classroom level, the teachers themselves are assuming that the transaction between the knower and the learner is to take place within a social justice lens, or we are, you said radicalized. Mm -hmm. The teacher is supposed to give the students the ability to 
disrupt and dismantle all of these systems that they see everywhere in all of their life and take an active role in creating not just uh, destroying the dominant structure, but I assume creating a better structure. Is that true? Yeah, I, I think that's yeah, that's a very good assessment. Um, they, you know, you hear the word in education now a lot. You know, change agents. We want to mm -hmm. be change agents to okay. create change agents. Stakeholders uh, and change agents. Oh, yes, God. yes. We're gonna <laughs> say we're like gonna, the shock troops. <laughs> I know. We're gonna get gonna biased be, here. We're gonna be change agents to create change agents. Uh, and, and, you know, dism dismantle these oppressive systems that exist, mm -hmm. you know, politically and culturally and so forth. Um, in terms of, you know, what, what uh, that's my question is always, what do they plan to build mm -hmm. after they've dismantled? I, I don't I don't know. I don't think they know. I think they have a kind of a, a fantasy in their head of what type of society they'd like to see. Um, but I don't think they've thought it through that far. I think they're so concerned with, with fighting the invisible enemy and with dismantling that they haven't given it a lot of thought. Um, but these are teachers. Do they not? <laughs> are they not interested and curious and, and forward thinking? I mean, they're, they're progressive, too. So forward thinking is a part of their mandate. Yeah, right? I, I got to say, I mean, teachers are not necessarily. I, I, I'm not trying to disparage the profession, but I will say that. The majority of teachers are not um, as intellectual as society uh, assumes. These a lot of these people are, you know, they're they're decently intelligent, you know, uh, and they they went into the profession because they either like kids or they like um, the the job structure and some of the benefits. But um, a lot of teachers, they're not, they're just average folks. These aren't, you know higher university professors that have mm -hmm. thought all this stuff through. I think a lot of them have been caught up in it. I mean, my, I joke a lot about English teachers being how political they are. And I, and I ask, you know, what, what, where, what do they know about, uh, oftentimes history or, or sociology or any of these things. And they, the, the truth is sometimes they know very little, um, but they speak about these issues a lot because it's it's become popular to do so. I mean, you know, uh, someone I know, a colleague I know is, is a health teacher and is super political and knows astonishingly very little when when you press around these things um, hmm. and, and has a very politically active agenda. I don't know how much that goes in our classroom. I'm assuming, you know, when you're that political that it has to come up and hmm. that it has to be part of your uh your instruction, whether you intend to or not, but does she I, do uh, stretches for justice? <laughs> yeah, Junk, jumping I, jacks yeah. for liberation. Yeah, I, I think her her big thing is you know the uh, the gender and you know kind of these you know narratives about you know heteronormativity and cis normativity, and so that's kind of probably what she brings more into the classroom. But um, mm -hmm. you know, I've I've seen English teachers bring in you know, these, these political and historical arguments and views, and they just don't know. I mean, hmm. even our, even our school board, they, they, they changed Columbus day to indigenous people's day. And they changed Thomas Jefferson middle school to, um, John Lewis middle school. And when I engaged with them on it, they, I was surprised at how little they knew about either Columbus or Jefferson. And, and how they weren't even aware that there were actually like debates about it, you know, well, like, you know, well, what's the debate, you know, Columbus, you know, was a mass murder. I'd say, well, who did he murder? Or he was, he was a rape. Who did he rape? You know, lots of people. Can you name one? Can you find us? Like, I just want to know if, if, if you can find stuff, you know, Thomas Jefferson, are you aware that there's historians have disagreed and it's not as clear cut and there's competing arguments and were you aware that he was active in the abolition movement and they just didn't know these things and and so yeah that's mm. that's a problem when you have uh, such you, people that don't know what they don't know mm. um, and as a teacher that's always been my you know sometimes people are surprised in my classroom you know when they're observing and a student asks me something I say I don't know Let's look at let's look online and kind of see, and I'll kind of explore it out with them, because mm -hmm. I don't know everything, obviously, and and I'm I'm aware of what I don't know, and uh, I have no mm -hmm. problem saying that. But I think a lot of teachers think that they kind of find security in believing they've have it all figured out, and that they they should know everything, and that's dangerous. Okay, so 
we were talking, well, my question was about the future, but you're saying that they don't even know the past. So. I, yeah, I mean, really, yeah, I don't, what's their plan for the future? I think they, I don't think they've thought it out beyond, um, they kind of have, you know, the, the, the fantasy of this Bernie Sanders style socialism. And, you know, I mean, I say that literally, they oftentimes, you know, well, hmm. you know, if you follow Bernie Sanders and we'll do this and we'll be like a Scandinavian country, everyone will have health care and every, you know, We'll have, you know, perfectly representative government by all racial groups and white supremacy will be dismantled and blah, blah, blah. And it's like, okay. oh, I don't know what that means. I, okay, okay cool. Like and some of this stuff, I'm like, sounds okay. Some of that sounds great, but like, how do you plan to get there and okay. will it work? And yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you were watching this going on, and at some point you couldn't keep your damn mouth shut. Yeah, I've I've always had that problem. <laughs> <laughs> so what happened there? I, oh gosh! You and know, where did you start? Where did you start talking? It sounds like you were inquisitive. Your first foot was. Yeah, I, I think you know I I've always been um, somewhat of a contrarian. I always push back. I always challenge. I think people inside the school knew me as someone who didn't you know would ask these questions, who was a skeptic and so forth. I just wasn't as vocal about it, and I didn't push. I think what happened is over working in public education, the type of school I work in, it's a very dysfunctional, toxic, urban school environment. It is. I can't describe like the, you know, I, I hate to use that word trauma, but there are the things mm. you see and the things you experience and what you're exposed to can, can really break you. And it breaks a lot of people. And I felt broken by it at one point. And, and so for, for a period, I, I just went along with things. I felt like, you know, you don't, the rule there is if you don't make waves, you'll be fine. So, you know, come in, do your job, clock out. That was kind of the thing. And after, you know, initially when I wanted to really change the system and I noticed things, it just got me in all this trouble. And I just felt defeated for a period. And I don't know what changed in me. It was so oh, I'm sorry. just to uh, expand on that. Yeah. So you were talking about a uh, traumatic school environment. So I think that what you're describing has at least two layers. We can just break mm -hmm. it into two layers. The one is the student body and then two is the administration. Right? Yes. It seems like what was uh, breaking you was the administ dealing with the administration more than the students. But you were okay dealing with the student I, body I think and it, I all think the it stuff could that be was both. going on there? I think okay. it could be both. I think, you know, definitely, I think, uh, at least with kids, I could understand their kids. I think the administration was definitely hard. When you have adults who are in leadership positions pressuring you, in some cases bullying you to be quiet, and, you know, you see things that are wrong, and you're you're supposed to look the other way. You're supposed, you know, when you get disciplined for trying to do your job or even, you know, raising issues that, you know, you're not supposed to speak about, that's really hard. And, you know, even sometimes with the students, I think, uh, you know, witnessing fights, students beat each other up, that, that can take its toll on you, um, feeling kind of uh, students, the, the apathy, you know, not coming to class, just treating it like you're a babysitter okay. sometimes. And it wasn't always that way, but it was enough where it's hard. And um, I don't blame the students, however. I, I actually empathize with them to a great degree. And I'm like, man, if I were at their age and coming into this environment, just what it looks like physically and the level of dysfunction, I, you know, everyone... Um, I'm not saying teachers aren't responsible mm -hmm. and there's no culpability. I'm saying that everyone gets victimized to a degree by these institutions, you know, like, like a prison sometimes, you know, especially the people at the lower end, you know, the, it's, you saw it everywhere and you saw a lot of people, they just, they check out and they uh, substance abuse is, I think, a bigger problem than anyone will talk about with teachers, with staff, because they're trying to cope with hmm. such a dysfunctional environment. Wow. Um, okay. Yeah. And so, so that, that, that wore on me for a while. And uh, what changed, you know, I think I was kind of woken up in 2020 when um, the George Floyd riots were going on and they happened in the, in the city where I teach in Waukegan. And I saw, you know, working class town, people's businesses being destroyed and violence and 
and hatred. And I saw it from former students. I mean, the stuff they were, you know, I had former students and it was hurtful, the stuff they were posting about white people and this and that. And I'm like, hey, man, like, I, I can read this, you know, I, I hmm. taught you, I've done that, you know, I, like, you know, like, you're characterizing me with this idea of people that is just so at odds with your experience with me, you know, even people I'd personally helped with, you know, it's not something I bring up, but, you know, whether it was, a, you know, pregnant students, getting them resources and stuff. So that was kind of hurtful. And I thought, where does this go? Especially if, if this is what is, you know, each generation is being kind of indoctrinated into. And this is what we see when things get bad socially. We see this disorder in Cass and Pack. Where does this lead? And it kind of woke me up and I said, what are my options? I can keep going along in the system. I can be quiet. I can collect a paycheck. I can retire at 55. Hey, maybe that's a good deal. Or I can just open my mouth and say, I'm seeing it. This is what's happening. This is what I'm afraid of. And I considered the two ways of doing it. I said, I can do it very subtly and quietly. And I said, I might make myself a target or, or I can go shock and awe. I'm just going to come out there and just not mince words and be forceful. And part of the reason I did that was because I said, look, if I'm going to, if I'm going to go down for this, I'm going to go on as loudly as possible. I don't want to be the, you know, pulled into the office and Hey, we saw a few posts you're making online. So that is uh, that's what I decided to do. I just didn't expect, you know, it, to draw as much attention as it did. And, um, and, and other teachers too, you know, I get messages from other teachers. I thought I was crazy. I thought I was the only one. I thought I, these were only my fears. So okay. in some ways it has validated a little bit, you know, where I feel like, okay, no, I'm not, you know, me, I, I, there are other people witnessing this and, and seeing it and, and then, you know, being part of a bigger conversation. I, you know, I don't think it, the stuff I've posted, I'm, I'm sure you've seen some of it, you know, from my, mm -hmm. my own school district. You know, I have teachers in there that think like I'm mentally ill and I'm like, are you seeing what I'm seeing? Like, you do not see this. Like, even if you agree with it, can you at least admit that it is political? Can you just admit that? Um, hmm. So it's, it's wild. <laughs> so that's kind of your tactics, but what's the content? What's your, what's your message? What are you exposing or what, what's the positive value? And then what are you uh, up against? And we've, we've kind of, uh, kind of talked sure. about it a little yeah. bit, but I, I want, the first thing I want is I want people to be aware of how much more pervasive and institutionalized, um, political ideology is in their children's education. Um, I want them to know, to, to see examples. This is, this is just a little take, this is the, you know, the tip of the iceberg. And what I've been able to find is, you know, with very limited resources and very limited access. So I've been able to find this stuff and it makes me wonder, gosh, what am I, you know, what are people not sharing on public drives? What am I not getting through for you? I want people to know that they're not, you know, I wanted to validate to parents when, when this first started happening, I heard, you know, I felt there was a lot of gaslighting, like parent, these crazy parents, they, you know, these nutcases, they think this stuff is going on in their school. And I'm like, okay, I've seen it. And, and I can put some validity to that. Mm -hmm. And I, I want, you know, in terms of what next, I think what I'd like to see is I'd like to see parents now. And, and, and teachers taking this information and, and being active in denouncing it and, and going to their school boards. I think it is probably going to, it's going to take grassroots mm -hmm. movement to, you know, school boards, I don't think are even very aware of this. Um, a mm -hmm. lot of the times they rubber stamp things and that, you know, they think it's kind of silly too, but I think we need to show them like, here's what's going on. Here's how your schools are being used for political purposes. Um, you know, I've got a. I set up a meeting with my school board president on Wednesday because I said, I said, hey, you know, you've seen me, you've gotten emails about me. I said, now let's, can we talk? You know, I got got your attention. Can we talk? And I'm hoping that can be more constructive and where I can at least just get them to just look at this and just consider that maybe there's a little something there, even if he agrees with some of it, and and maybe our common ground can be, look, whatever we agree, whatever we personally believe, can we try and move towards some neutrality to some balance? Can we pull back on this a little, or can we at least consider that there's another side? Okay. Um, I'll be honest, I'm not, you know, people sometimes 
say what you know what what do you think is going to change and save us? And I, I'm I'm not very hopeful on that. Uh, and I think it's so deeply embedded. Uh, if you were to ask me what is a what's my solution, I think that public education, in some way, to use their word, has to be dismantled. I think it is it is so controlled by by one group. It's so captured that the only way to get around that is to have some type of choice movement where people you can see diversity of different institutions with different ideas offer people choice okay Uh, yeah it's interesting that you describe this school that is in your word toxic and Mm -hmm. uh, dysfunctional and stressful and not doing its job very well and a lot of people are just kind of basically coping with it so it's a it's a failed state already Yes. And then this ideology comes. And it's almost the perfect ideology because it points all the problems out there, outwards. Exactly. Oh, we, we, it doesn't matter. The, actually, all the fault of uh, the, all the blame can be shifted away from us, from this school and these students and uh, their apathy and their violence and our drug addiction and, you know, mm-hmm. or whatever, you know, it's all, it's all the white man's fault or whatever. It's all something right. over there. So we're going to go out there. We're going to change the world um, and just kind of leave our, our mess behind, right? No, no, no child left behind, but the mess certainly is, is closeted over there. It's, it seems kind of convenient. It, you 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 hit the nail on the head there, and that's that's what I've been saying. I've been trying to think of a way to you know recently write about and kind of convey that. But yes, it it fits perfectly, and um, it explains away all the you know. It's not because it's a failed state; it's because white supremacy is why kids aren't reading at grade level, and, and kids aren't misbehaving because of deeper underlying issues. It's uh, they don't have culturally relevant pedagogy. There's an answer for everything, and it's such an easy and convenient answer. And for the teacher, you know, you imagine a lot of teachers who have been kind of disconnected from their profession. They feel like I come in, the kids don't listen, administration doesn't listen, I hand out a worksheet and I put my head down and I just try to get through the damn day. And now they have a calling. Now they have a higher purpose again. That's exciting. That's invigorating. That may fill them with that passion. And hey, it's you know, even if the kids aren't reading it great, even if I'm not being successful as a teacher, if I can be successful at the message. And it clicks perfectly with kids too, because they're at this age where they're wanting to form identities. And what an exciting, you know, idea that hey guys, there's this big bad, you know, there's these oppressive systems keeping you down. Join the fight and you know, that's exciting. It's mm. it's just it works too well. That's what scares me. Um, hmm. and, and and as a historian, I mean, look, anytime you, you see these types of movements and, and kind of as a, a preface to terrible things happening, you oftentimes have countries that are experiencing stability and a variety of problems. And someone comes forward with an answer that's just too convenient and it fits too perfectly and and it works for both the right reasons and the wrong reasons. Hmm. Yeah, the summer of 2020 was uh, quite a shock to me because I saw something happen on a very, very, very small scale with like 2,000 people in the middle of the woods is what I saw in 2017. And then 2020 comes along and thousands of people are flooding the streets and they're all chanting the same things. And, you know, in, in downtown Olympia, I heard a story about a business owner goes into a shop and says, I need a black Black Lives Matter sign um, because every night my windows are getting broken. And if I put the sign up, they'll probably stop. You know, that was the state. So Mm -hmm. they were, you know, and then our mayor, mayor, she bowed. She did the whole bowing to the mob thing. And then a week later, they spray painted her house that she's a fascist, you know, or whatever. So there's no winning to it, but it's just it swept through. I don't know how uh, long lived it is. I don't know how stable it is. I don't know how sustainable it is. I mean, that's one, it's kind of a, a salted hope, but it just, it burns itself out. It makes a bunch of demands. And then the leaders of it, whoever gets away with it ends up, you know, with multi-million dollar houses. And then the underlying issues are still present, still there. Nothing's really changed. It's just, there's this kind of performative outburst. 
it seems. Um, but then on the bureaucratic level, what I saw in my test case at Evergreen and then what I saw across the country in the wake of the riots of 2020 was this bureau bureaucratization of it. Now we're going to start pouring billions of dollars into these trainings and we're going to do our performative thing, you know, and mm -hmm. we're going to keep on going through these motions. But even that, I don't, I just don't see how it, how it ends other than I guess in violence, but the actual state, I don't think the actual institutions and all the bureaucrats that are pushing this, they don't want to give up their homes. Right. They, 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 they I mean, Maybe on a public school level, they'll give up their jobs, but I don't see any of these professors that are saying, we need to relinquish our, our privilege. These white professors never like quitting and then giving their job, you know, bequeathing their job to a, a colored person or whatever. I'm sorry, a person of color. <laughs> uh, you know, um, the, the system, it seems like it, it's just kind of surface. It's really good at shuffling things. I don't know, though. Right. What, what do you see on that front? Yeah, I, I think it'll, you know, again, when it, it's baked in, it's becoming increasingly baked into kind of the, you know, people's consciousness. I, I think it'll kind of ebb and flow uh, with an mm -hmm. overall, but I okay. think when... It'll kind of bounce. Gets and and I, uh, but I, but I think you're right. There will reach a point where uh, something may rapidly accelerate it and it will, you know, will it go on forever? Probably not, but it'll rapidly reach a point where things get very scary very quickly and, and you mm -hmm. could potentially have revolution and regime change and then only after it's worked itself out through the worst possible way, then maybe do we return to some semblance of, of normalty. But what scares me is what it takes to get that worked out. Mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, the, the politicians and the kind of intellectuals that – um, are stoking these flames. I mean, they're like, you know, wizards who have conjured up something they don't understand and can't control. Hmm. And they're kind of conjuring up this populist anger and resentment and blaming. And I think by the time, you know, they start to realize that there's a risk to them, it may be beyond their control. Hmm. And they may not be able to, you know, put the spell back in the box that's mm -hmm. that's what usually happens with these things it's it's mm -hmm. it's all kind of politically convenient and it becomes you know for a lot of people it's exciting it's fun because i'm part of some i do think there's kind of a you know a, it fills the sense of people's need for stimulation and excitement and then when things get real they get real and you know what then um mm -hmm. yeah but, but you, you know, when does that happen? How quickly? You know, I, I don't know if I don't think we know. Um, I spoke to a teacher from the uh, he, he grew up in the Soviet Union and he teaches here now and he shared, you know, my concerns. And, he, you know, his warning was he said these things can can happen so quickly and accelerate so quickly. And he talked about how kind of, you know, six months before the Soviet Union, you know, dissolved, he said no one would have thought that would happen. Uh, he said, but so it happened so quickly and so rapidly and people were shocked. And he kind of said the same thing here. So I saw 2020 as just like a preview of a taste oh, and um, okay. of, of, right. of what could come. That's, that, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's when Jeez. I saw it, that's I saw it. it's com coming soon uh, on, a, on a bigger and broader scale. I don't oh, know yeah. what it'll take, okay. yeah. I, I, but, but I, I think it's definitely a possibility. Well, um, okay. Uh, if, if, if we're sinking, if we're on the Titanic and you kind of see, oh, we hit a bump, but that's not the real iceberg. It's still sure. coming. Um, are you prepping in some way? Prepping? Um, you know, I, I, I'm not, I wouldn't say I'm a prepper, but do I have means to defend myself and my family and, you know, a little, little food and supplies? Sure. Um, I, I don't know what good it will do, but I do know that I want to be able to, you know, protect my family and to kind of ride out the storm. Um, I, mm. I'm, I'm an unusual person in that I, prior to COVID, I, I was, got into reading about pandemics and emergent diseases and I started, you know, going off and people thought I was crazy and I started telling my family, we need a pandemic, you know, this was in 2016, we need a pandemic survival kit and I'm like, what the heck are you talking about? And when COVID happened, you know, this whole thing, the point of the story is it taught me a lesson. When COVID happened, you know, this was in very early January, I'm 
ranting to my students and I'm buying stuff about 109 fives and I bought some N100, all this stuff. And my students are like, uh, and you know, other teachers are like, what is wrong with you? You're scaring the kids and stuff. And all of a sudden people were like, you know, holy crap. And I was, you know, just being one step ahead, being able to have a little foresight can make a huge difference. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of how I view with this is I think having just a little bit of foresight again, you're not preparing for the end of the world. You're preparing just for, for a little rough period, <laughs> if you want to put it nicely. And, yeah, okay. uh, hmm. yeah. Mm. So let's say this episode, this podcast kind of like goes out into the world and, and sure. kind of meanders around and somebody shares it with somebody and it ends up, uh, landing in the ears of a teacher who's been worried or quizzical about this stuff. And, thinks, you know what, this is a problem and I'm not the only one. Okay. What can I do now? What can they do now? What are some of the resources out there for them? I, I think this is something I've been reflecting on recently and learning. And, um, I think the first step is, is connection and relationship building with other people out there who can support you and who can validate a little bit of your concerns and discuss it. And I've, I've found that there is, there's a community out there of, of teachers and parents and just other interested people that, that share our concerns. And I think what we need to do is we need to start building up, you know, the foundation of any change and the foundation of, of survival is, is building networks and relationships. Um, I, I will say, I don't, if I knew what the answer was, um, gosh, I'd, you know, probably have a lot of money or something like that. You know, I kind of feel like I just set out on uncharted waters and I'm still kind of at sea right now. And I, I see other people, they're kind of joining the ship and I'm like, yeah. And I'm like, I don't know where we're going, but mm -hmm. you know, more people see the ship and more people come. Um, I, I hope that we're able to do, you know, I, th maybe if we can get at least some more, maybe if we normalize disagreement and, and a chance if we normalize to a degree challenge to this kind of orthodoxy in education, that'll at least be a start where they where they don't just reflexively fire people because they can't, you know, maybe there's in a district of a thousand teachers, even if there's 20 or 30, they say, God, we're going to fire 20 or 30. They've kind of come together and spoken out instead of just one. Maybe it's just about, you know, putting a little resistance there. Mm -hmm. Um Man, I and I, I know it's hard. Who want? No one wants to give up the, you know, the job security, and you got pensions. Um, hmm. But I, I hope that if if people recognize and and realize it's such a bigger problem and and such a bigger threat than just one job, and I, I think there are teachers that do, then I say, well, you have a choice to make. You know, how long can you be quiet? How long till they f find you out? And then where does this go? Are you safe and are you safe in your silence? If you think you are, then then go ahead and do that. I didn't think I was. I didn't think hmm. silence will keep me safe forever. Um, and even, you know, as we know, all it takes is there's teachers that have tried that and they just say one wrong thing or they express a disagreement. Someone finds something out on them and, you know, they're gone or they're they become hmm. the enemy of their colleagues. Um, so, yeah. So find find each other, network and connect and have these dialogues and discussions hmm. and, and do some research too. start to, you know, I, I, you can do it anonymously if you want. I FOIA'd my own school district, start to see what's out there. So you can start building kind of a case for it. I think that's information is also really important information and relationships. Hmm. Um, and, uh, you know, again, maybe, maybe some people smarter than I will, will figure out some, some solutions with the information I've been able to provide with the messaging. Um, maybe I can be a part of that. I hope. Um, yeah. <laughs> hmm. Just taking a moment, stepping back from this very timely discussion. Mm -hmm. What's uh? do you have any uh, historical stories on hand that, that really blew you away or uh, some saucy uh, tidbits from hu human, uh, humans gone? by uh, or, or a period that you're most interested in or something like that? Um, in terms of like, you know, what what type of history would you say I'm interested? Like, would I 
Yeah, like like uh, uh, yeah. Do you have any? Do you have anything historical that we can uh, hear from you that that you you see when when you tell that story, people are like whoa, or or when you found that story, you're like whoa. Um, you know, I I guess let's see. I I connect a lot of this. I I spent a lot of time studying the the Weimar Republic uh, in, in Germany before the Nazi Party took over. Um, that's something that always, you know, interested my students. And I think a lot of the connections I make, I, again, I hate, I hate doing the, like the, the Godwin's Nazis. law. Here yeah, we are. I know. Here we go. But you know, as someone that studied it, there's, it's such a, it's such a timely lesson. And what happens when you have people that are dispossessed and people that are, are suffering hmm. and you have kind of these baked in narratives. Um, and a lot of people think that, you know, anti-Semitism and, uh, began with, you know, the Nazi party. It goes way back. You can trace it back to, you know, Luther and hmm. you can trace kind of the, the German, some of these German, uh, nation hood concepts back to Bismarck. And I've always been very fascinated by, that's just a timeless lesson about, um, you know, Hitler wasn't, people look at him and think like it was, he was this fluke and like people just lost their minds. The reason he, and, and, and maybe this is what surprises people, uh, Hitler was a madman and he was crazy. I say, no, he, he knew exactly what he was saying. He, he was successful because at the time, if you know, that's what historians do, put yourself in the minds of people. If you can put yourself in the, the head of someone in 1931 Germany, his message made so much sense. It fit so perfectly. It explained everything that needed explaining. Mm -hmm. And people are like, what, what are you saying that, you know, that Hitler, I'm not, so I'm not saying he was right. I'm saying that his message made sense to German people. And it was a very to them I, it was a, it was a sane message it it gave cause and explanation and it gave purpose and it resonated with them hmm. and so i think sometimes when we when we look at history we have to be careful not to dismiss you know what we think is crazy as cra we have to look at kind of the function and the purpose it served and and how it resonated with people and i think sometimes when we're looking at like Maybe this ideology today, some people say, ah, oh, it's just crazy, it's going to go away. I said, okay, to you, but put yourself in, inside the heads and the perspectives of people that believe it and buy it. And it's the same with, like we said earlier, with teachers. They're not just crazy, like, they're not just like, hey, yeah, I just bought onto all this because I, you know, watched a conspiracy video. They have, they feel in some ways dispossessed and disconnected and without purpose and not part of a failing institution that, mm -hmm. you know, they've been blamed for every problem. Well, now... Now you have this this ideology, these ideas and arguments that fit perfectly. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, you see that time and time again with history. It's just the right idea at the right time, mm -hmm. providing people kind of the answer that, that they're always looking for. And, um, mm. yeah, I don't know if that answered your question. <laughs> well, uh, since we're kind of... We're an hour into the conversation. We can get a little political. Uh, sure. And uh, whoever hung around would probably be open to uh, exploring <laughs> this issue. But the same story was said about, or and is said about Donald Trump as this Hitlerian uh, kind of uh, guy with the right message, pitching the right message, and harnessing mm -hmm. the discontent of the masses. And it's a very you could you could overlay that story just as well with uh, you know. Uh, you know, all the jobs going overseas, all the economy being handed over to these globalists, you know, and even that is like a dog whistle if you get right. into certain kind of conversations and stuff. But Trump had a salient message, um, rude, crude, uh, and, and just kind of battered that system. And uh, he was very easily uh, encapsulated um, as a dangerous person to the system and also as a savior to people who want that system out of the way. So I, I'm just I just bring that up just to just a question. If everybody's thinking that the other side is Hitler, where are we going to go, right? No, oh, yeah, no, that's definitely true. Well, I, I, there's a not even forestalling the Third Reich. Is there a third way? You know, <laughs> like between DEI and MAGA. You know, even if they're I'm not saying that they're equivalent. Um, I, we can make an argument if you want, but you know, if everybody's using that lens, how are we served? Wow. Yeah. Um, I've been thinking about this and, um, 
you know, it's, it's funny when, gosh, I'm trying to think maybe six or seven years ago when I started to politically kind of shift from someone who was progressive to kind of libertarianism. I was very into like, you know, patriotism is is goofy and it's silly and stupid hmm. and screw the state and blah, blah, blah. And I, I've changed recently. I've been like, you know what? People people need some type of kind of higher identity. And so my third way has been kind of a, um, a, a revival of kind of that inclusionary Americanism that can bring us all together. Because I feel like it's the one thing um, where we can all say, you're American, you're American. Hey, guys, we can all share this identity together. We can all identify with each other as part of the same kind of tribe and we can, we're all in this together. Um, and so, you know, it, it changed my way even about thinking on like the national anthem or before I used to be like, oh, that's silly. Yeah, it's like a state prayer. And I'm like, well, you know, maybe it is, but it's the one thing that we, you know, maybe that's just how people are. Maybe, you know, people, maybe they're by nature kind of have this inclination towards religions, towards higher purposes and higher callings. And mm -hmm. faced between two choices, one where we, you know, recede into tribal identities and one where we embrace a broader identity. And we do have these moments where, you know, again, it seems silly, but, you know, where we have a national prayer together and we're all in it together and we're all, you know, holding hands, kumbaya. Maybe that is the third way. Hmm. Um, and I recognize when, you know, especially people, you know, progressives will say, well, America, you know, it, you know, if you were black and this and that and Hispanic, you couldn't be an American. I said, okay, well, well, now you can. Like we, we've, we, we address that. We, I think, even you know the, the MAGA hats. Like they, they're. Donald Trump was able to win some of them because he was inclusive of them. No one black with a MAGA hat went to a Trump rally and got kicked out. That they actually would like love them because they felt like it was validation. Like, see, we're, we are, you know, accepting of all people. I, and I'd heard that from people that went there that, you know, people are like, I was so surprised what it was. You know, I thought I was going to be being black or Hispanic. They wouldn't like, they just cared that I was part of that tribe. And so maybe if we can kind of expand that out a little bit beyond, you know, without the, the necessarily the divisiveness that Trump brought. And I, I didn't, you know, I didn't hate Trump. I didn't agree, I agreed with him on some things. I disagreed with him on others. I did think in some ways, one thing I did like is when he did have that, those moments of kind of inclusive Americanness where, you know, I mean, he held up the LGBT for Trump thing and people cheered. I was like, okay, so he can't, you know, like he can bring these people together and, you know, he can, and he, and no one had a problem with it. So maybe that is a way out. Um, I, I don't know. Kind of in the same way that, you know, Europe kind of had to do that after uh, World War II, where they kind of had to say, maybe we, not, we need to start thinking of ourselves as, as, as a European people and stop killing each other and fighting. And yeah, you had the Soviet Union stuff, but you at least had Western Europe kind of get together and put aside a lot of their differences. And maybe we can do the same thing on an American level. That's uh, my thought. So expanding on that, if you were talking to, uh, I guess, a 11th grader, a junior in high school or somebody, you know, just a normie on the street and you're saying, OK, we need a higher identity mm -hmm. and let's call it America. And it's got some history, some good stuff, some great stuff, blah, 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 blah. But what are the principles of this? What, are, what is the character of the American identity beyond being an identity for Americans? You know, I think um, I think what Americanism kind of ultimately represents is it, it or it did it had for a period was kind of the embodiment of, of Western civilization. Uh, it had inherited and encapsulated uh, centuries of struggle for things such as you know um, individual rights. Um, respect for people's property and their their liberty hmm. um rationalism um you know the, the scientific method and the way of viewing things not that those have always been you know we we've had our own battles you know internally but i think that that's hmm. what america's meant to me is kind of the it's captured kind of Westernism, the the best things and, and and striving towards a better version. I mean, in some ways, the American ideal is kind of it's progressive and in, in, in really a original sense in that it wants to be 
better. It wants to aspire to its ideals. And we keep calling upon that. And, Hmm. um, you know, I think for like a lot of my students, you know, a lot of them are immigrants and stuff. They like the the American message. They love that idea of like, you know, we, we hard work and we have fun and we enjoy our life. Like they kind of that's kind of how they think of America. And you come here and you can be who you want. You can do what you want. We come together on some things and we disagree on others, but we're all in this together and hmm. we're here to make some money and live good lives and enjoy freedom. I mean, it's, you know, it's kind of corny, but it's like, it works, it works for a lot of them. They've just been sold recently. They've been told that they are excluded from that by white people and they've started to believe it, which is really tragic. And hmm. that's, it makes me sad that they think that. Cause I don't think, um, I mean, except with, you know, Donald Trump and the, the immigration thing, especially, you know, we, we can't ignore that. We have a huge issue with, uh, you know, illegal immigration that we haven't solved. And then there was, you know, that was certainly a real wedge. So I, I definitely understand that. But, um, hmm. you know, I, I see the American dream and ideals. I really, you know, alive in, in many immigrants. Um, and I've seen that in my school, too. And some of the most it's it's kind of sad. It's like what happens. The more kids are socialized and in school here, the more negatively they speak about America, the more they think it's silly, the more they think it's a this is a terrible place. It's oppressive. You know, I had a student from uh, he was from Nigeria, he just recently arrived here. And I remember one day he kind of like shook his head, you know, a kid no one was standing for the pledge. And he's like, you guys have no idea what you have, how great this country is. And he stood up every day. Because it meant something to him. He valued that. And he saw, he knew what it was. And I think he was worried. You guys don't know what you're going to give up. And you guys don't know what, what a hard life is, is like. Hmm. Um, hmm. It's a uh, historical moment. It certainly is. It certainly <laughs> is. I, you know, or I think we're all, so much of what we're trying to like make sense of it as we go through it. And, uh, mm-hmm. I wish I knew how it would turn out. I, I just, you know, and I and I hope that I'm, you know, as much as I kind of stoked flames, like, look at this, you got to be aware of this, pay attention. I hope that, you know, we can begin to channel that somewhat productively. I still think a lot of people need to be woken up. I think that, you know, you see this on social media. I mean, it's definitely the people that are woken up, they, they support you and they're behind you. And, and OK, we're getting together. But we also do need to start getting to the other, getting to the other or people in the middle, maybe that can mm. Maybe, um, and even maybe some people, you know, on the left who can say, you know, I can see how this is a problem. At least we're bringing it into schools. Like, you know, just consider if it was the opposite. If you had kind of the the Trump agenda being brought into schools, you had the Department of, instead of equity and inclusion, you had it of of, of freedom and, you know, yeah, whatever. The and Department of Patriotic Affairs. Patriotic Affairs, you know, and so I just, <laughs> just to consider that and, and maybe like have the respect for children's education, not that it can mm-hmm. ever be ideologically neutral, but being closer to something that's balanced and, and respecting, t- I mean, what a crazy time it is when people are like, I don't, you know, I'm conservative. I don't want to speak out and get fired. Like, I, I mean, did anyone ever think like, 30 years ago that you have a situation where like high school teachers, I mean, maybe people did, I I don't know. I'm only 36, but um, where, you know, you get like fired for being a conservative teacher. I mean, does that, is that not revealing? People say there's no ideological indoctrination. I say, really? So, so why are you trying, why are you trying to get me? Like, how are you able to use this in your mind to get me fired? You know, there are people saying emails, look at what he's saying. So, okay. If, if there's no agenda, why is my job, you know, on the line. Why have other people been fired? Like, uh, you know, because you, because you can post, you know, you can you can engage in some crazy politics and say some crazy things if you're on the left, but only when it's super super extreme and out there do, is the board forced to move. But most of the time, mm-hmm. it's you're you're safe, you're protected because you're speaking the language of the orthodoxy. Um, hmm. mm-hmm. So you are uh, at. Uh, risk uh, seems like somewhat of losing your job and if I don't want to speculate on your uh, forward trajectory but what would you end up doing or how can people support you and uh, do you think that you would uh, move from teaching or do you think that you'll try to find another way to go about teaching should you be denied teaching I 
I don't know. I, I think that what what I probably would like to do is to continue um, this message and con- get people organized. So I'd hope to find something where I can do this. I mean, hmm. maybe a struggle for a while, even if I can write about these issues and my experiences and kind of call people to action and start to outline some concrete steps they can do to kind of reclaim their school boards and reclaim their schools a little bit. Um you know, it's so much of it. I ask myself that every day, you know, what happens tomorrow? Tomorrow you're fired. Then then what? And I, I don't know. I, I know that, you know, thankfully my family supports me. But, you know, like everyone, I get I got bills and stuff and I'm not not out there. I mean, you know, I, I have a I have a Patreon, but I, I never promote it or, you know, because I just feel like that's I don't know. I just feel weird doing that. I know some I know some people have told me, like, you need to advocate for yourself and you need to prepare because, you know, I have a child and stuff. But, um, mm-hmm. you know, it's just something I'm not comfortable doing, at least not yet. And maybe if I lose my job, I'll kind of <laughs> be uh, have the fire under me a little bit more. But, um, you know, most mm-hmm. of all, what I'd like is, you know, for people to get out there and, you know, just connect with me. You know, I'm on a Twitter at CB Heresy. I encourage, you know, I, I get a lot of teachers messaging me. I get parents. I really like that. I really like connecting with people. And just even sometimes a lot of teachers have said, like, just like, just thanks for listening. Like I have now a, another teacher who I'm able to talk to and I, I don't have to worry that they're going to like leak this or report it. I can just tell you what I've been going through and how I feel. Mm-hmm. And and that's really rewarding for me. And even with parents, too. I mean, I sometimes I'll give them a FOIA template. Sometimes I'll give them some things to look for. Sometimes sometimes I'll tell them that, you know, no, I, I actually don't think that's like a big They'll say, is, is this, you know, is this CRT? And I'll say, no, I, I don't think that's a big deal. Um hmm. And, and that's what I that's what I really like. I'm just still trying to get connected with people, I think, because I, I don't have all the answers. I, I don't know everything, but I'm hoping the more people I speak with that we can come up with some creative solutions together and I can contribute and they can offer some. And uh, that's that's the one nice thing. I mean, I really have especially, you know, Facebook. I, I feel Facebook's kind of <laughs> it's become kind of dated. And I just don't see people like the engagement movement. <laughs> they're just trying to they're always trying to just push you like, hey, advertise this and we'll get you more likes. Um, but I do feel like on Twitter, there's these kind of nice intellectual circles that have been able to form where I really do feel like I've been able to get like, you know, not necessarily always on there, but like build relationships with people I have these meaningful connections and stories. Even if we don't always disagree, there's people are just like, hey, I, you know, I, I consider myself a liberal but I found you interesting and I want to talk more about that. Like that, uh, hmm. that was kind of cool. Um, hmm. I'm sure you've probably felt the same way too. I mean, you know, you find oh, these, yeah. yeah, it's well, uh, I'm connected. Like yeah. Everybody's it's, business. It's great. I mean, it's like, it's like, but you know, you, then you do, you start to feel like, I think a lot of times when you're in this environment, I, I remember feeling in 2020 when the stuff got out, like, I feel like I'm crazy because I'd post something on Facebook for my personal account. I would be thrown under the bus and be on I was like, no one would come out and say, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, hey, mm-hmm. I agree. With, even if people did, they wouldn't say it. They wouldn't even, you know, I know there were people that agree with me. They just kind of stood silent. And so that's why, like, when I was a teacher and I saw parents getting thrown under the bus, I saw teachers like Paul Rossi, you know, took a big chance and, you know, uh, got mm-hmm. let go because of that. I'm like, I can't, you know, do the same thing. I got to let people know they're not crazy and I can. Uh, that, that, that really, that makes a big difference for people when they know they're not alone. Um, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's very, um, one of my critiques of the ideology that's, I'll just call wokeness right now, uh, Mm -hmm. or whatever we're talking about is, uh, on the ground when it trickles down into action, when the correct circumstances transpire to, you know, activate everybody they're they're all trained to be activists and then they're activated like we saw in 2020 a lot of the behavior uh is destructive and is uh dehumanizing Mm -hmm. and one thing that allows that to happen is because people have a uh, they're thinking in in a grand context they're Mm -hmm. thinking in terms of the end of history in a way or they are projecting their egos onto this huge format that they're part of something huge and they lose connection with the human. And that is one way in which activism becomes uh, radicalized and then uh, very, very dangerous. And so I really appreciate that your, that your activism, uh, whether you want to be thought of as an activist or not <laughs> too late now, too late. It's, it's about the human and it's, it's, it's cut down to a human size about the personal and the relational Thanks. Rather than yeah. the identitarian and perspectival. 
Yeah, I, I, I've, and I try to keep that mind. I mean, I, you know, I think we, we're all guilty sometimes of, you know, sometimes I'll post and I'll delete it or I'll rethink about it and be like, yeah. is that fair? Am I doing? But I'm trying to. Get you do the, meme. I see. Oh, I see sure. you meme. Yeah, I love. I do. <laughs> and you know what? Post too. <laughs> I, I do. Yeah, I engage in some of that. Sometimes, sometimes I do like to. I like to prod the bear a little bit. See who's, uh, see who's <laughs> reading. I like to kind of tease, and I, that's just. I, I got a sense of humor too. So sometimes I'm being tongue in cheek and. Uh, you know, I just want to kind of, you know, stick it. And then sometimes I try, you know, there's two sides of me. Then sometimes I'll be like, all right, yeah, yeah. Let me, let's let's come down here a little bit. I, I think you need a little bit of both. Sometimes I, yeah. I've talked to people about that when you're involved in any type of activism. There's people that will say, you always need to be loud and brazen and outspoken and this and that. And then there's people that say, oh, no, you always need, you can just always be mild mannered and soft. I said, look, sometimes you need a little bit of both. And maybe that's why people, you know, like following me is because they do get a little bit of both. Sometimes I'll stir them up a little and sometimes I'll, you know, come down and have, you know, a, a heart to heart kind of conversation. But I'm, I'm just being me. That's just who I am. I got this kind of duality to me. And so <laughs> that's the one thing I can't be, I, you know, you can't be, I have I've felt like I've lived so long being, you know, kind of living this lie as, as a teacher and being quiet and dishonest that hmm. I just, all I can do is just uh, be myself and People can hmm. think what they may, but I think most people that know me know that my heart's in the right place, and I, I do care. And even if I jab with memes a little bit, I <laughs> try to <laughs> do it uh, sparingly. Well, one a week. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, I'm going to finish up the recording part of our discussion. Thank sure. you so much, Frank, for uh, allowing me to hear you out and uh, giving your uh, thoughts and uh, experiences to my audience. Oh, thank you, Benjamin. It was uh, really fun, and yeah, time flew by, so good conversation. Yeah. yeah. Congratulations for reaching the end of the discussion. If you enjoyed it, do be sure to leave a review or a comment or a thumbs up or whatever you need to do to show that glorious algorithm that this is some good stuff. And do be sure to go and check that back catalog as it is brimming full of fantastic conversations. Links to provide monetary support are down there in the description as well. Have a good night.